session. There you go. So uh, it's an honor uh, to introduce and welcome Dr. Abbott to our international conference today. Dr. Abbott is professor of medicine at the Warren Alford Medical School of Brown University, and she's the director of the Cardiac Cath Lab and the interventional program uh, at Brown's. Uh, and an especially warm welcome to Dr. Abbott as she's a Yale alumnus, and you know she did her medicine and cardiology training at Yale, as you were uh, mentioning to me. So uh, thanks so much for uh, you know taking time out and joining our conference. Uh, she's going to be talking about a, a really important topic about bifurcations. Um, so go ahead, Dr. Abbott. Thank you. Uh, again. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, and and uh, thanks everyone for uh, for joining me this morning. It's always a pleasure to come back and speak to uh, my colleagues at Yale. Uh, we were just reminiscing that I trained there in interventional cardiology 20 years ago uh, this year, so a couple of decades, and it's good to see all the familiar faces. I uh, chose the topic of bif bifurcation PCI. Uh, in the past few years, I was a founding member of the American Bifurcation Club, and you're all probably familiar with the European Bifurcation Club, uh, but really an effort to um, uh, standardize uh, the the techniques used in bifurcation intervention and disseminate information and um, uh, you know, uh, hold webinars and teaching seminars so that people can have optimal understanding of this complex lesion subset. And uh, you all know that you know, bifurcations account for up to 20% of PCI. And sometimes, some days you feel like it's much higher and every, every time you do an angiogram, it's bifurcation PCI. And these historically have um, worse procedural outcomes because of predominantly associated with side branch issues like side branch occlusion. And the restenosis rates um, really in the past were quite a big issue. Uh, but, of, but of course, uh, you know, outcomes have been improved over time, particularly in patients enrolled in clinical trials who may be a little bit more straightforward than we see in day-to-day -day practice. I put this here because it's from the year I uh, graduated or was an interventional fellow back in 2001. And if you look at bare metal stents, and this is that the dynamic registry, which is an, was an NIH registry, which was sort of captured the history of PCI. Um, and trainees now probably don't know much about it, but you can see that at, at 12 months, event-free survival for a bifurcation PCI was you know, down about 68%. And for non-PCI, it wasn't much better, but it was 70, 74%. And you see, we had uh, exceedingly high rates of um, target vessel and target lesion failure. About one in five patients um, had, had this problem. So, um, you know, moving now to um, where we are today, of course, drug eluting stents have really helped quite a bit in reducing restenosis, but there's, there's a couple of uh, points I really wanna make. One is that we try to classify bifurcations and we historically have used this Medina classification for decades. It's been you know, used since I was a fellow and it's trying to simplify bifurcations um, into this binary description, zero or one, whether there's greater or less than 50% stenosis in the proximal main vessel, distal main vessel, and side branch. So you can see there's a lot of different confirmations of where the plaques can be distributed. And the true bifurcations are really those in which there is significant involvement in both the main vessel and the side branch. And for those, the decisions are often more complicated as to whether to use a provisional or two stent strategy. And then there are non-true bifurcations, which is all the other ones where really the disease is predominantly limited to one limb of the bifurcation. And in those, the provisional strategy is often um, highly sufficient. I will say though that this um, bifurcation classification is, um, you know, it serves some purpose, but it's really not that predictive of outcomes because it just does not take into account the majority of uh, concerns we have when we're approaching bifurcations. So more recently, um, now about eight, nine years ago, there was um, uh, the definition group and the definition trial where they really wanted to take into account what makes a bifurcation complex or simple. So unlike the Medina, which is just anatomic, anatomic and binary, this is um, 
really trying to define what are what are truly complex bifurcation lesions. So it's really helpful to be familiar with the definition criteria. And you know, it's not an easy thing and sometimes you have to look it up. But when you're interpreting the literature and you're trying to understand what types of bifurcations were included in the study, um, when they only provide the Medina, it is, um, it's limited in how you can interpret it. But the uh, definition criteria um, are really only two specific classes of true bifurcations, the Medina 111 and 011, and they have to have a significant side branch. And then um, it dichotomizes into whether this is, you're talking about the left main or a non-left main, because of course, the left main by default is going to be, have a more significant side branch. The circumflex is obviously going to supply more than 10% of the myocardium. Whereas in many other bifurcations, the significance of the side branch, not in terms of disease severity, but in terms of the percent myocardium served can be much smaller. So here you see that, um, you not only have to have significant or greater than 50% side branch stenosis, but for it to be considered a complex bifurcation in the uh, left main, you have to have at least 70% and a 10 millimeter lesion length in the side branch. And for non-left main, it's 90% and 10 millimeters. So again, you're talking true bifurcations with severely diseased side branches. And then in addition, uh, you have to add more complexity. So either calcification, serial lesions, a very narrow angle, um, uh, the reference vessel diameter becomes small, thrombotic lesions, or very long main vessel disease. So just keep this in mind uh, that uh, to be, be considered a complex lesion by definition criteria uh, really is com complicated. And uh, this shows the prognostic uh, utility of this. And what you can see is over the course, predominantly of the first year, and then um, the trends remain the same in these Kaplan Meyer curves, but you see an immediately higher risk, uh, predominantly of post procedure and early MI and MACE. But at the end of the day, there was no difference in cardiac death, and here, even target vessel revascularization. So even when we try to choose the most complicated bifurcation lesions, we can see that it's really hard to um, distinguish like how the patient is going to do. But we, we honestly, we obviously know that um, the procedural complications are going to be a lot higher in complex PCI. And this is not looking at outcomes um, depending on what strategy was chosen to treat the bifurcation. It's just looking at it as a whole. So, you know, side branches can include for many different reasons. Uh, you can have just a, a shifting or a snow plow. You can have something transient like spasm. You can have a dissection in either the main vessel that closes the side branch with a flap or a dissection into the, the side branch occlusion. So you have to keep all those factors in mind. Um, just again, this is more historic, but um, we, we don't even carry bare metal stents in our cath lab anymore. I don't know if you guys do, but... Um, you know, since the current generation stents are thrombo resistant and have such good outcomes and now come up to five millimeters, we, we don't carry bare metal stents, but <clears throat> this just goes to show that um, this is a, an old trial that looked at restenosis in uh, bifurcations and uh, with the drug eluting stents, again, this is first generation, the restenosis rates in the main vessel were about 5% and in the side branch about 15%. And when you look at the bare metal stents, you have 28% and 43%. Um, I spent about 20% of my fellowship doing brachytherapy cases. So you, you guys training now are lucky. <laughs> um, so again, we know that you're only gonna use drug eluting stents in a bifurcation. And then in terms of um, what are the <clears throat> types of rates we're seeing now, uh, this was uh, also a very small study, but just to put it in here to make a point, there are really not any studies head-to-head -head comparing current generation drug loading stents to each other in bifurcations, and probably for a good reason that it would be really hard to see a difference. But in terms of Everolimus eluding stents being the current generation and Zoterolimus here, which was the Endeavor, which was, we would call it a DES light. It's no longer on the market, but you can see here that um, the TLR rates were very low 
um, here at 12 months. So we're starting to achieve really good outcomes by 2011 with drug eluting stents in bifurcations. So when I trained, uh, there were a lot of randomized trials going on, um, predominantly in Europe um, by the British Bifurcation Club. And they did trials like BBC One and Nordic. And then we had, I think it was Colombo doing Cactus, but there, were, there was a lot of you know, interest about you know, how to approach these lesions. And um, uh, these were randomized studies where in a given uh, bifurcation, which the majority were true bifurcations by Medina classification, usually about 80% in these studies, um, you would be randomized to a provisional pro approach, which was stenting up the main vessel versus a, a planned two stent strategy. And you know, all of those studies in total showed that the provisional approach um, was you know, obviously shorter uh, procedural and fluoro times, less contrast, lower equipment costs, lower rates of periprocedural MI, and equivalent rates of restenosis. So that body of literature really supported a provisional approach, um, at least for the types of bifurcations that were included in those studies. Um, I think that um, th they did a good job at the time and crossover rates were really low to the different strategies. But the problem is that um, the techniques used in those studies are not contemporary and things like proximal optimization technique didn't exist. Um, you know, kissing balloons were generally recommended, but not always performed. And the two stent technique in those studies, there would could be three or four different techniques used. So there was no standardization of that. Um, and again, and most of these were performed by pretty experienced operators. Uh, so again, we said these were pretty limited. Um, you know, to date, most bifurcation studies are not um, guided by FFR or IVIS, and really trying to determine the functional significance of your side branch is very difficult, and uh, visually estimating it is, um, um, you often don't, you can't understand if it's hemodynamically significant or not. However, in, um, in the literature, it, it has been hard to show a benefit of using uh, hemodynamic guided approach to bifurcations. There was a, you know, a sub-study of one of the DK crush studies that did not show better outcomes using FFR compared to angiography. Uh, but of course, it's always an option and uh, we should use all the tools we have. So if, if there's a question, that's certainly something to do. And right now um, there is a large trial going on called the October trial which is over a thousand patients is almost done enrolling and it's looking at OCT guided um, treatment of bifurcations versus standard of care where, where you could or you may use IVIS if you want. Also, all of these have some enrollment bi bias. If you are pretty sure you are going to treat with a two stent strategy, you're not gonna enroll in a trial that has a 50% chance of assigning you to a provisional approach. Um, but even in patient level subgroup analysis, they couldn't really find a, like a group that benefited from two stents, such as the true bifurcations, good bifurcation angles, like greater than 70%, we would consider a nice wide bifurcation angle, whether you had a large uh, side branch or more extensive side branch disease, in this case defined just as five millimeters. Um, at least in these early studies, we couldn't really identify which patients needed two stents. So I do want to spend a little time, and this is predominantly for um, the fellows, about um, you know how to optimize the one stent technique because it's really not simple at all. And sometimes people fall in the trap of thinking they have to do something complicated. And I would say that even a provisional approach is very complicated to do it perfectly well. So obviously it starts with vessel wiring and um, you know, obviously we wire the main vessel, but depending on the confirmation of the um, uh, bifurcation, uh, would recommend wiring both vessels, and we can talk about that. Doing, uh, you have, you may or may not need to pre-dilate. Uh, you you should image most of these cases. I don't have that on here, but uh, 
whenever, I mean, most of the time now we just have either IVIS or OCT ready to go at the beginning of a case, but I would say it makes doing your bifurcation, um, it takes the guesswork out of it. And why do you want to be guessing in a lesion subset that has high risk of comp? In terms of main vessel stenting, uh, we can discuss whether you trap a wire or not. I remember, I don't know if Chris Howes is on the line here, but I was sitting in the booth in that combined room and this is before anyone would trap a wire. And Chris was doing a bifurcation and he trapped a wire, but I don't, it, I don't think he knew it was trapped and he stented. And I was like, did you mean to stent that wire into this, trap it in the side branch? And it easily came out and it wasn't a big deal. But I remember when, um, again, how things change in interventional cardiology, you wouldn't have thought to, to do that. You thought it could damage the wire or be dangerous. And certainly wire protection of side branches has become pretty norm. Uh, proximal optimization technique has really improved uh, bifurcations quite a bit. We'll talk about that. And then you have to assess your side branch after main vessel stenting. And you know how do you do that? What are the definitions of suboptimal side branch result? Do you base it on flow? Do you base it on stenosis? Do you base it on hemodynamics? And should you or do you need to do a final kissing balloon if you're doing a provisional approach? And then um, if you don't have a good outcome, how do you bail out? Do you use a TN protrusion? Do you use a culotte? You know, what, it, what is your key approach and what factors guide you into one, one approach or another for your, for your bailout? And then um, there are some subtleties to this and we didn't even talk about sizing and size of the stents, size of the balloons. So I think I have some things in here. Um, Let's talk about to jail or not to jail the wire. Uh, there's a publication just this year in Jack Intervention. It's not randomized, uh, but it's from the COBUS registry, which was nearly 3,000 uh, bifurcation interventions. And they looked at, um, uh, they excluded people with two stent techniques and those that had the side branch uh, dilated because they didn't obviously want to randomize or they didn't want to. Um, those patients, you would generally not pull the wire after you've already dilated the side branch. Um, and you see that uh, what they found was, number one, acute closure of the side branch is very uncommon. It really was less than 3% in the whole cohort. Um, and in those that had the wire protection, it was 1.8% versus 2.9 in those in whom there was no wire in the side branch and target lesion failure was the same. Uh, but when they looked at a multivariate analysis of, um, of when the wire protection was beneficial, it was really in those that had um, uh, the side branch stenosis greater than 60% um, or very long lesions and severe lesions in the main vessel. And I th think it was sort of what I was taught back in 2001, which was, you know, if it's a 50% stenosis, it's going to be less than 10% risk of closing. And if it's a 90% stenosis, it's going to be higher. And so um, things do hold consistent over time. So anyway, I think um, there really is no harm to, to jailing it. And we can talk about if, if it's stuck, how to remove it, if that comes up. But um, this is from the EBC consensus paper. And I really encourage all the fellows to have this on their um, laptop or available and to review it for it's one of the really good resources for bifurcations, because you see here it's got, um, you know, the cartoon like pictures of the bifurcation, but also fluoroscopic images so you can look at positioning. And so when you're talking about best technique for a pot. Um, normally I would ask the fellows but because I can't see you guys, I'll just keep talking. But so you want to, um, if you're stenting the main vessel, so we're talking about a, a regular provisional. If you stent into the side branch, it's inverted provisional. Really it's the same, just depends which branch you're stenting into. But um, there are a couple of things you have to take into account. Uh, the distal main vessel diameter may be much smaller than the proximal main vessel. So using intravascular ultrasound or OCT, is the best way to get the absolute sizing. Because in some bifurcations, the difference in size can approach or be greater than one millimeter. And it's really important to understand your, your stents, the stents that you carry 
and the expansion capability. Like you must know that say a 3O Onyx can go to 4.0, whereas stent Y can go to 3.75 or stent Z can go to 4.25, right? Like you don't wanna pick a stent that is not going to be able to be expanded to the diameter of the proximal main vessel. So that's number one. You size your stent generally one-to-one -one with the distal main vessel. And then you want to extend into the proximal main vessel at least eight millimeters because you want to have an available length to do your proximal optimization technique. So that is most of the time feasible. Um, sometimes if the left main is really short, you may not have the full eight, but then you're right in the aorta, so that's fine. Um, sometimes it's difficult if you're running into multiple bifurcations and you don't wanna cover a sec second bifurcation. So it may not always work, but it's also helpful to carry some very short balloons like six millimeter balloons in the lab um, for the pot in the case that you can't leave at least eight millimeters. So the second step is going to be a one-to-one -one sized NC balloon proximal optimization with the distal marker of the balloon at the carina. So you see step two here is the pot. Many of us keep the wire trapped. I have not had a problem with this because um, it, it allows you to optimally place your balloon uh, for the pot. So um, again, some people are uncomfortable and they wanna pull it, but I would recommend leaving it in. And then you see uh, your pot here. Then the next step is um, your rewiring. So in the fluoroscopic image in three here, uh, there are a couple of ways you can rewire. The main issue here is just recall, and again, you can either memorize it or just think about the anatomy. You want to rewire through a distal side branch because when you move the struts in the proximal main vessel against the contralateral wall, you want to take the struts with you. If you're going really proximal, um, you're, you're going to have more stent deformation. So it just makes sense that you want to wire distal struts. So there are several strategies. Some people remove the main vessel wire and then advance it into the side branch and then pull the jailed side branch and knuckle it into the main vessel. Some people leave the jailed one in particular if you see any compromise of that branch and take a third wire and wire de novo, try again to not get caught under any proximal struts. That's why you've already done the pot, it's unlikely, um, and get into the side branch. The third way is to take a dual lumen catheter like a Suzuki or a twin pass, put it over your main vessel at the level of the bifurcation and re rewire. I only know one person who does that routinely, this guy, Aaron uh, Korngold, who's over out in Portland. It does add a step and, um, Usually you like getting the dual lumen catheter back out of the body without trapping it as a technique is also difficult. So um, I think most people, I often just pull the jail wire and then rewire. That's pretty much what I do and it's pretty simple, but those are all possibilities and you can ponder which one and it may differ in different cases depending on how difficult it is to wire the side branch. Okay, and then, um, you know, it's possible though that you may be done after the pot, but say you want to do a kissing balloon, which we can talk about pros and cons of that. Then what you're gonna do is you um, get an NC balloon sized one-to-one -to, -one to the side branch diameter. Usually I'll get a 15, but if it's a really short proximal vessel, you could use a 12. And one-to-one uh, -one in each vessel, size to the distal vessel. So distal main ve vessel, distal side branch, one-to-one. -one. You only need to bring it back a few millimeters into the carina. The kiss does not need to come all the way to the proximal main vessel. When you perform a kiss, it will make the proximal main vessel more oblong as opposed to circular. So the best technique is to repeat the pot at the very end if you have done a kiss. So again, this is provisional and it looks really simple, but there's already you know five steps and multiple mini steps involved there. Um, so what's more important, the pot or the kissing balloon? These, this is obviously not randomized data, but the Europeans get, you know, they're really excited about these bifurcations. And um, in this particular, particular retrospective analysis, um, where the pot was performed, again, this is data they've been accumulating over time, the pot was performed in like 20 to 40% of the cases. 
that the target lesion failure was significantly lower in patients that had POT, but that the use of kissing balloon did not influence target lesion failure. And again, this is uh, from the um, Ultimaster registry, and a lot of these patients had provisional stenting. And then the other thing to consider is what types of balloons to use for your post dilation and your pot. And this small study would suggest that you really want to use a non compliant balloon to get your um, diameter the best. Okay, so now we've done our um, mandatory steps of the provisional strategy and optimized it. And then how do we define, you know, how the side branch is doing? And again, this is just a list of of different ways. You could be satisfied if you just have, you know, Timmy 3 flow and anything less than Timmy 3 flow could be considered side branch compromise. You could require reduced flow and stenosis, like some of the trials did back in the early 2000s. Um, again, this is just showing that, you know, we kind of just make it up and we say what, what, what's compromised or not. I mean, most of us, if it visually looks bad, don't, don't want to leave it. But I think this is just to emphasize that the true definition of a suboptimal side branch result is a really bad side branch, you know, generally very stenotic and or slow flow. Okay, so do you need to touch the side branch in a provisional technique? Like when do you go back and, um, and you know, open up the side struts and do a kissing balloon? And this is from COBIS-3, also not randomized, but looking at the simple crossover, just placing your stent, doing a pot, image looks good, you're done, versus going back and opening the side branch. This is from uh, Jack Asia last year. And um, you can see here that uh, really there was no difference in target lesion failure or uh, target lesion revascularization. And side branch TLR um, was um, numerically, but not statistically higher in the, um, in the group where they did uh, do the side branch uh, balloon inflation. And uh, here you see that, um, again, there was a trend. Um, uh, it did not, there was no interaction with doing a pot and doing the kissing, but um, the side branch opening was better, uh, trended to be better when you did pot, when you did everything at once. Okay, so now we're gonna um, do the optional steps, which we already discussed back in the, in the, in the figure where we talked about the best way to do the provisional, but um, remember the distal wiring, and this is a really nice fluoroscopic image here. So you see when you did your pot, you've um, nicely expanded these proximal stents uh, away from the side branch, and then, then you can more easily get into the distal vessel. Uh, we talked about the sizing, and we talked about um, doing a repot as the optimal method. Okay, let's see. Good, it looks like we have plenty of time because we're gonna convert now from the provisional to um, a bailout. So say you've done provisional, that was your plan and you have a suboptimal side branch result. So what do you do next? Um, my recommendation would be to use one of these approaches, T, T in protrusion or culotte. Uh, rather than doing a reverse crush, I would highly discourage people from doing a reverse crush um, because it's uh, the confirmation of the metal and the side branch, um, keeping a well-expanded side branch is very difficult. Um, it can be done if you try to do a tap and you mess up, <laughs> not mess up, but say the it doesn't land exactly where you want and it's too far across your main vessel then you may end up um, doing a reverse crush. But um, T would generally um, only be attempted if it's a true 90 degree bifurcation angle, which is very, very uncommon. But um, I took out some of the slides just so we wouldn't run out of time. But the problem with attempting a T is that if you're off the 90 to any degree, there will be either overlap like a tap or there will be a lack of coverage, like a gap. So, you know, doing a, a T generally will become a tap or a gap. And um, uh, the gap is bad. <laughs> so um, usually what we're looking for is T in protrusion, meaning, and I'll show you an example of a case, but it's just 
bringing the stent struts in enough that um, the total ostium is covered without protruding too far into the main vessel. And in essence, you're creating a neocarina here. You're creating, an, you're gonna have metal here and it's gonna be a neocarina. The benefit of a tap is there's, it's technically simple compared to culotte, DK culotte, DK crush. It has the fewest number of steps and rewiring. And so I love the tap as a bailout, particularly when I'm not talking about the left main, but I have used it in the left main on occasion. And then the culotte, the culotte is just like a little bit more of an extensive tap. So the difference between tap and culotte when you're using it as bailout is just that the culotte, you have to be able to reach the, the main vessel wall and expand it. You do not need to cover the whole proximal vessel. You can just come a couple of millimeters into it and then optimize it, which we'll talk about. Okay, so here I put in some real live cases so we could wake everybody up at this hour in the morning, but this was a case I did, I don't know, a month ago. And um, this patient has ischemic cardiomyopathy. They were a surgical turndown. They've got left main disease got LED disease, they've got hypokinesis and scar and ischemia in the interior wall. And I um, have to decide what to do about this um, uh, bifurcation in the distal left main. So let's see here. So what is the approach? I think we're transradial. We're probably with a seven French guide or a sheathless guide. We have both vessels wired. Generally, if the left main is significant before doing imaging, I will just pre-dilate quickly so that the patient's not ischemic. And then the first things you're gonna do is do, so that's our pre-dilation. Then we're gonna IVUS both limbs. Because how are we gonna make a decision if we don't have the imaging about what to do? So in this particular case, um, and the image just got a little jumbled up, but here's a nice longitudinal view of the bifurcation. And what you can see is um, when you image from the circumflex back, that the circumflex uh, distal um, diameter here is four and there's minimal disease and some calcification. And here that in the LED, there was really no normal segment, but in the LED uh, segment that appeared angiographically most normal, the reference vessel was about 3.0. And this picture moved over here, but the reference vessel of the left main was five. And when we looked at the left main, we had over 270 degrees of calcification and it's a really big vessel. So this was an interesting one to try to figure out what was the best approach. And what we decided to do is, um, is actually do an inverted provisional uh, stenting from the left circumflex into the main vessel and then decide what to do about the LED. It's a very unusual choice, because most people don't treat the LED like a side branch, but Colombo said once to me, if you have to do it, you have to do it. And in this case, because the circ was very large and the anterior wall was only partially viable and the diameter differences, that's what we chose. So um, we knew we could use a 4-0 stent and it could easily expand to 5-0 in the left main. We, in this case, chose to do IVL with a 4-0 IVL shockwave um, because of the calcification and we would have needed a very large uh, rotational atherectomy burr to debulk that left main. So we did that first, um, but basically we did all the steps of the provisional and we did our pot and I'm just gonna move through. So in the interest of time, in this case, uh, we did choose to do the final kissing balloon um, uh, because again, we're talking about the left main and. Um, most of the time I will go back and do a kissing balloon if it appears safe. And then we did our final pot and then we IVUS. So what we found at the end of doing that was that right at the proximal edge of the LED, and you can see here, um, you know, where the uh, two branches are becoming the left main, but here's at the LED, we have a dissection in the LED and you have a little flap there. So again, we couldn't leave it at that point. And the options for bailout, we didn't think um, culotte was a good idea because the vessel lumen of 3.0 and trying to get that back into a 5.0 left main, we could have a potentially oversized stent and deployed it at low pressure to do the culotte, but we opted here for a 
uh, tap. So here's just um, some images of how you do a tap. So it's most important is the positioning. And you can see that you want a one-to-one -one size balloon in your, um, in your first stent. And uh, that is one-to-one -to, -one to your distal main vessel, or in this case, the distal side branch, because I'm inverted. And here you see you've, we've positioned the stent really one millimeter back into the left main or into the proximal bifurcation. This particular stent um, brand, the uh, stent is inside the marker, not aligned with the marker. So you really need to know the specifics of the stent brand you're using and where the actual stent strut is compared with the marker. But in this one, it's inside. So you can see them, we check that in a couple of views to make sure we have really good positioning. This is where things like stent boost can really be helpful just to help you get this right. And hopefully, you know, stable guide position, et cetera. Uh, so then you deploy your uh, second stent here as a tap. Then um, you basically move your tap balloon back slightly and you have your other balloon already in place and you do a kiss to create the neocarina. And then when you do a pot, the important thing to recognize is you can't put it in too far or you're going to crush your neocarina. So here, you can see on this little picture here, number five, you've got this neocrina. So you have some struts here into the uh, main vessel. And when you do your kissing balloon, I mean your pop balloon, you have to stay proximal to that or you will crush your neocrina. So um, avoid that. So what does that look like? Let's see. So here are a couple of views. We are pretty satisfied with that. And, and then we want to re-image and, uh, you know, we make sure our distal LED stent is well expanded, um, our left circum, uh, circumflex and our distal left main, I was looking for big MLAs and here's our neocarina. So here's that extra stent strut, which is um, protruding. And this is a good example of, we landed it pretty well because um, it's not, you know, obstructing to any degree the lumen here. But it's also important just to document what approach you used in the chart and the steps you use. So if someone else ends up having to go back and treat the patient later, that they really understand um, so they don't distort the geometry of the stents you've placed before. But here you see, here's our little neocarina. And in a big vessel like this, 40 to 50, probably not gonna be any trouble. So that's uh, a T in protrusion which again, it's pretty commonly used for non-left main bifurcations. And you can see that the number of steps is pretty small. Uh, so now let's move on to um, cases in which you wanna plan two stents up front. So obviously there are some times when you look at uh, a bifurcation and do the characteristics and it's likely a, a definition criteria complex uh, bifurcation that uh, you're gonna use two stents. So um, that's a lot of times in left main. Uh, could be because the side branch is a CTO uh, or again, complex um, definition criteria. So uh, this was the definition two trial. And you know what is the evidence that um, with contemporary drug eluding stents in truly complex bifurcations, such as defined by the definition criteria, that using a two stent strategy upfront has advantages over a provisional approach. So this trial, uh, which was published in 2020, um, showed much lower rates of TLR and target lesion failure when the two stent strategy was used up front for these types of complex bifurcations. And this is in the background where the majority of two stent techniques were DK crush, which again, many people feel is one of the most optimal geometries for um, bifurcation stenting. So again, we had a little more data now to suggest, unlike the old data from 15 years ago, that in certain bifurcations, two stents up front is beneficial to reduce um, MACE over the long term. And this is the first time, uh, one of the first times this was shown. And then, of course, most of you are familiar with DK Crush 5, which was published about five, and really got a lot of press um, because in this, 
left main bifurcations using the DK correction compared to a provisional strategy resulted in significantly lower rates of target lesion failure. And that was whether it was a you know, definition criteria complex or simple Medina simple lesion. So, um, and there were a lot of caveats. Um, you know, these operators from Asia all did, um, you know, over 300 PCIs a year. They all did over 20 left main PCIs a year. They used a fair amount of imaging and, you know, it was unclear whether these results were going to be replicated um, broadly. Um, but again, in, in good hands, you see the benefits of this approach. And this is just, again, some bench modeling of the different techniques and um, how when you use the DK crush versus, say, bailout to stenting or secondary cap, that you'll have less problems at the side branch. I will say, though, that um, when we're talking about bailout to a culotte or doing a culotte up front, that similar to a DK crush, if you're going to choose a culotte, do a DK culotte. So the more you add optimizing the stent confirmation to your procedure, the better your outcomes are going to be, the less chance you're going to have trouble recrossing and kissing and everything else you need to do to make it an optimal outcome. So I just want to bring up that um, in addition to DK crush as an upfront strategy, you can use DK culotte as an upfront strategy. And where you may choose a DK culotte or a DK crush, um, it could be, um, in general, I would choose it if you had pretty equally sized main vessels and side branches, and you had a narrow bifurcation angle, then I think it's a very good approach. So it could be for left main or non-left main. Um, but we don't have to go through this step-by-step step, because you guys will have it, but you can also look it up and we're gonna talk about the DK crush steps, but it's a similar concept. I will say that not everybody around the world believes that you need a two cent strategy for a left main or complex bifurcations, and in particular, the Europeans. And EBC Main, which was, um, again, more recently published last year, was you know fairly large trial, randomized trial of um, a provisional strategy for left main versus a two cent strategy. And in this case, unlike all the old trials, the provisional strategy was done exactly like I showed it meticulously with every step and the pot and the, you know, uh, kissing in the repots and everything. So um, when it's done that way, you can see that the results are very good for provisional, even for the left main. And it's an argument that, again, I wouldn't default to two stent just because you're talking about a left main bifurcation. I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, but you can see, be familiar with EBC main because uh, it is an important trial. There are a lot of meta-analyses of bifurcations. I've published some, other people have published them. The problem is that you're basically taking a bunch of trials where they're not using current techniques. You know, Some of them may not have contemporary juggling stents. They may not have POTS. They may not have described um, the two stent strategy that well. So you can see it's a little bit you know, limited, but in these studies in general, DK crush comes out ahead as the favorable technique. And again, I think it's because in DK crush, there are 12 steps. And if you do them all, you're probably gonna have a pretty good outcome. It's just this, there's a lot of steps. Okay, so let's talk about the DK crush. Um, this is only the first six steps, so you can see it becomes very difficult. The things I want to point out about the DK crush, so uh, it's going to start um, with stenting of your side branch back into the main vessel. You're going to si size it again one to one to your, uh, your distal side branch, or if you're inverted, your distal main vessel, and you're going to have it protrude one to two millimeters back into the main vessel. You will already have a one-to-one -one sized balloon, non-compliant if possible, sitting in the main vessel so that after you deploy the side branch and you remove the side branch balloon and wire, then you're going to do your first uh, crush. In this case, when we're talking about when to jail and remove wires, you don't jail wires between or within stents 
just in non-stented side branches. So you definitely remove the wire. You don't want it entangled in the stent struts. So then you do your, uh, your first crush. And now this is um, the only situation where when you rewire, you don't want to go distal. You want to go more proximal because again, you want to push the extra struts up against your, your side branch vessel. So you're going to do your rewire. You do your first kiss, empty balloon, one-to-one, size to your distal vessel. Then you're going to put your second stent. Remember, extending at least eight millimeters into the proximal vessel, making sure your stent sizing is accurate. Then you do your pot. Then you're going to recross. Again, here they're showing you sort of mid-vessel, uh, mid-stent strut. You just want to avoid very distal stent strut. And you want to do your second kiss. And then here, another pot. So here I just wrote all the steps and I'm not gonna read them, but um, one of my fellows was uh, interviewing for a CHIP fellowship and uh, she sat down in the room with one of the interviewers and he said, okay, uh, tell me the 12 steps of the DK crush. <laughs> so I thought that was funny because, you know, again, you could memorize it, but it's sort of intuitive once you get going and worst comes to worst, you keep a picture in your lab so you don't forget a step. Okay, so here's an example of a case where you might want to do a DK crush. And this was a case I did, I don't know, probably like 12 months ago. Uh, this was, a, I think, a dialysis patient. Surgical turn down, occluded right, distal left main, proximal LED, proximal circ, heavily calcified. Um, this looks like femoral access. I think the patient probably had no radial access. So in this case, um, I didn't show all the imaging, but there was a lot of calcification and we chose to use orbital atherectomy in this case. Of course, you could have chose rotational atherectomy and this was pre-IVL, um, but we did debulking. Uh, we got the side branch treated. Again, here's all the steps just in the interest of time so we can have questions. Uh, stent any lesions that are distal in the circulation that you need to take care of. Um, first kiss other stent, pot, second kiss, and then here you go. So again, it can take a, bit, a little bit longer. And then we staged the right and did that another day. Um, but I think the nice thing about the DK crush is you can do it in a six French guide, obviously, depending if you need more um, support for distal lesions, et cetera, seven French, it comes in handy. And the other time you definitely need a seven French guide rather than a six is if you're, if you're looking at left main bifurcations, and you're going to need to do your um, kissing balloons with, say, like a three, five, two, three, five balloons or a three oh and a four oh. And you're talking about doing a pop with a five, five. It gets really crowded in six French and sometimes it's not compatible. So um, often if I'm doing left main, I'll just go with a seven slender in the wrist and a seven guide or like I said, sheathless guide. So summary of when to use DK crush. Um, if your risk of side branch loss is high and it's a complex lesion, and you're planning two stents up, up front, I think the DK crush is a very good choice. So um, in the EBC, they recommend it for complex bifurcations, extensive side branch disease, anticipated difficulty in reaccessing the side branch because you're stenting it first, you won't have acute closure. Uh, so I think that's always a good, um, good advice. So I just want to summarize by saying that um, really assess each bifurcation lesion individually. In addition to looking at just Medina classification, think about the complexity in a more detailed way. Um, consider the significance of the side branch. You know, sometimes you'll see an operator putting a lot of attention into a branch that may be supplying like 5% or less of the myocardium. Um, optimize the chosen technique, whether it's pot, whether it's bailout, to a two stent, whether it's DK crush or DK culotte, um, you know, it's, these are never simple. Um, your bailout options are gonna primarily depend on your side branch angle. So T, tap and culotte, T for 90 degrees, tap for, you know, 90 to 70, you might be able to push it a little and culotte for more narrow angles. And in the two stent strategies, you know, don't take shortcuts, do the double kiss instead of a single kiss, no matter whether you're choosing a culotte or a crush. So those are my recommendations for bifurcations in 2022.
Thanks, guys. Hey, Don. This is Steve. Thanks a lot. That was a great, great review. I'm a little disappointed to hear that you didn't enjoy your brachytherapy experience. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I Especially know. since I have two cases today. So, you know, trying to get my fellows pumped up for those cases. Yeah, yeah. Steve, well, Steve least, it was all about the gamma. It I was, was going to say, yeah. If, he, if, it, <laughs> <laughs> if it was a 17 minute dwell time and you could get a whole coffee down while intermittently flushing the guide, then, you know. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, we don't do brachytherapy. So we send everything to Kevin Croach and, and Brigham. But, you know, fortunately now we're in drug eluting balloon trials and, you know, it won't replace brachy because I know there'll be a lot of drug eluting balloon failures, but um, it would really be nice to have another treatment for restenosis in the United States. Yeah. But um, what do you think in your practice, the percentage of two cents do you end up with, you know, whether it's provisional or, or um, you know, yeah, I would say that there is a tendency in both the lab I work in and definitely in the United States to overutilize a two cent strategy. You know, it takes a little of the worry out, you know, particularly if the side branch, if you think it's going to close. Um, so, I, you know, it's really hard to say. I, I think, you know, are we around 50 50? Maybe. But for left mains, I would say now I rarely see our faculty doing provisional like rarely, even for, you know, relatively undiseased circumflexes. And I'm trying to push it, but, you know, people are not that comfortable with it. But I would say that I'm very comfortable with it. And if you image and you, you know, you've looked at some of the results of these trials in, uh, in different parts of the world, it's very, it's fine. And this whole thing, like DK crush is so superior to anything else. Is probably not true either. Again, I think you can DK cool out the left main. It's totally fine. Just get a good re result. Do all the steps. Do the double kiss. Um, but I think use use your your angle bifurcation angle to help you choose. Um, I what think is your uh, uh, personal take on uh, the whole DK crush five and EBC main controversy, and um, you know, because people have written and, and comparing both the trials, you know, EBC main did not really need. Uh, them to have done proctored, uh, you know, DK cases, and they're all over 300 PCI a year, uh, as opposed to EBC main, which is more uh, suggested that it's more reflective of, of practice, you know, these operators were doing 100, 150 PCI a year. Uh, and, you know, even if you compare the two trials, the EBC main had a higher event rate, despite having a lower syntax score. Uh, so is that reality? And uh, on the basis of that, yeah. you know, what would you be your, your suggestion at a societal level, you know, Mm -hmm. just knowing the whole wide gamut of operators who exist in terms of uh, oh yeah cases. absolutely i mean most operators in the u.s are doing under 100 cases and i don't know maybe 10 bifurcations i'm not sure so to ask them to do a really good dk crush is difficult um i'm part of this like abbott pci master's course and it's a really good course actually it's not meant for fellows it's for you know faculty of, of all ranges. I think Glenn, I don't know, Glenn is, um, I think I saw you on here, but Glenn, you were at one in Boston and it's remarkable. We have the bench models and uh, the operators can like actually practice doing the, doing the techniques. And you see a lot of people struggle with all the steps and the recrossing and everything. And, and if you're in a busy practice, I think it's really going to be, you know, challenging. So I think again, if you can get get away with provisional, if you're if the complexity is not there, you know it could be a true bifurcation. But if you don't have a truly definition complex criteria, uh, complex bifurcation by definition criteria, you can provisional is probably the way to go for most operators in the United States, and the patients generally do fine. So, um, and as long as you know a bailout technique like a tap or something, you're you're not going to have side branch loss. It's going to be okay. So. Um, yeah, I think when we're talking at conferences, again, amongst high volume operators, there are little camps of people who, you know, like one technique or another. But I, that's why I say like, you know, in the bench models and in the geometry and in the simulation, you can see uh, how the optimized techniques do better. Um, in the future, uh, there is um, a interventionist, uh, Giannis Hastisizis, who is at in Nebraska right now. 
um, and he does computer simulation of bifurcation. So he actually takes angiography and imaging IVUS OCT from patients. And then um, they use computational science. They, they give the plaque characteristics. So whether it's fibrotic, calcified, everything. So they know the distensibility of the vessels, they know everything. And then they model uh, like what a DK crush would look like, what a provisional would look like. And uh, they can actually predict <laughs> what should be used. So maybe 10 years from now, if we have, you know, uh, intracite on all our Phillips labs and we take an angiogram and now we have the um, contrast FFR in front of us to know if the side branch is significant or not. And uh, we can do imaging and uh, then maybe a computer will tell us like this lesion bifurcation is best for a DK crush. But until then, you have to piece it together in your head um, and do it that Sunita way. Sunita has a question. Uh, what strategies do you have in your toolbox for uh, recrossing the side branch? Yeah, that can be really frustrating. So um, again, make sure you do the pot before you try to recross. It does make recrossing much easier. So uh, do that first. And then um, normally I'll just try the standard wire approach with your workhorse wire, but um, trying different angles using a uh, polymer coated wire. The dual lumen catheter can come in handy if you just are getting if the bifurcation is more distal and you're having to recross a lot of the other parts of the vessel, you can just, I like the Suzuki, it's extremely low profile. The two lumens are very close together. You can bring that right to your bifurcation and then it, it's easier to keep changing your angle on your wire and try to get into that side branch. Um, you can always repot at a different level uh, to move struts out of the way. Um, so usually, and again, that's why the one benefit of doing a DK crush or culotte is the, the first um, kiss, the first time you cross and you do the kiss, you're, you're already moving some struts out of the way. So once you put the second stent in, you're really only then trying to recross through a, a single layer. When I was training, I mean, the mini crush was like the newest, greatest thing. Um, we would just put both stents in the body and deploy one stent and pull the wire and then deploy the other stent. And then we'd be like, woohoo. And, you know, obviously like half the time the, the side branch, we couldn't get back into it because now we had these poor angles, three layers of crushed up, you know, metal um, in the proximal main vessel. And it was really challenging. Um, the other thing you can use if you have like a really retroflexed um, side branch, you could use like a super cross 120 uh, you have to get used to that catheter because it's very angled and you you use it to wire, but you don't follow it, the vessel into the, that microcatheter into the vessel. I would use it to wire and then trap it out or back it out of the guiding um, system. And then you can use um, this reverse wire technique through the Suzuki where you make your primary curve and then you bend the whole wire back onto the Suzuki and you, you thread it over and you push past your side branch and basically it's like a hook. And as you pull back, it'll find its way in. So I've used that technique a couple of times. Um, uh, one of my fellows and I did a little, like how you do it in like the cath lab digest, <laughs> one of those throwaway journals on the uses of the dual lumen catheter. And it really has a lot of uses. And one of them, you can do that reverse wire technique. Um, that's usually for really bad angles. But most of the time I just try different shapes and a hydrophilic wire. I see that you mentioned that you use a lot of seven French, uh, you know, slenders and do a lot of these radially. So uh, in, in, you know, petite people and sometimes women, you know, what has your experience been with the seven French and do you switch to groin often for this case or? No, <laughs> I mean, I'm not one of these radialists who will never do femoral, but uh, I honestly do not miss the days of dealing with retroperitoneal bleeds and pseudoaneurysms and thigh hematomas. And in 2001, with big sheets and integral and rear pro, I think I was at the bedside most nights for two hours with groins. So I don't want to go back. But um, I use the UCATH, E-A-U-C-A-T-H, UCATH. It's a sheathless guide. It is uh, equivalent to, it's a little smaller than a six French sheath outer diameter, but it's a seven five inner diameter. 
it um, each guide comes with its own dilator. So you just put in a five or six French sheath, you put your 035 wire into the ascending aorta, and then you back out your first sheath and you put in the sheathless guide. Um, there are some subtleties of how to get that in there with, you know, obviously you bring it into the sending aorta, you have to take the dilator out and then you follow over a wire. They are really flimsy. They're very thin walled. They can slide in and out of the wrist. So, uh, and then we generally don't like to take a, take a derm them down because we need to be moving them. So, you know, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it offers a huge advantage if you can't use uh, a seven slender. Uh, or maneuver a guide. Often, you know, uh, we don't have the railway system. That's another way to introduce um, guiding catheters or often just the least expensive thing to do with difficulty tracking a guide is just to put a pigtail catheter or a long multipurpose, something with a taper, or you can do balloon tracking, but almost always you can get the guide in there from the arm. Do you, uh, do you have ultra thin struts and have you been using those for bifurcations or? Uh, we, or zero or, yeah, you know, we or don't carry or zero. <laughs> we're, we're a streamlined, financially streamlined lab. Um, yeah, that, I mean, now there are now dedicated uh, more left main type stents like Megatron. I mean, I mean companies are, are trying to make, um, you know, make them more radial strength, et cetera. So yeah, I think you have to really be careful. Um, I mean, generally the, the, the very thin struts are not gonna be a, a concern in the left main because it's only for the smaller diameters. And when you're talking about left main, even in the RS hour, you're gonna be using a bigger diameter, which is a standard thickness, probably comparable. Um, uh, we uh, are predominantly an onyx lab just based on our contracting, but why would you science? Um, we have, um, you know, back in the day with all the longitudinal deformation of um, a promise, that was an issue for a while. I don't think it's a big issue now. Um, we do have synergy still on our shelf, but, uh, you know, in general, I think most people are using Everolmus and or Zoderolmus contemporary stents. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was an awesome talk and uh, we all learned a lot and we look forward to inviting you in person someday. Um, yeah. So thanks again, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Hey, Chris. Hey, how you doing? Good. Good to good. see your name. <laughs> yeah, I got in late. I had another meeting, but it was really good. Okay, and, good to see you guys. Yeah, I was struck by um, the way you provisionally did that left main to the LAD. I, you know, I think a lot of people would have double quirk stunted that from the uh, get-go. Oh, I know, I know. I, uh, that's why I wanted to shake it up a little bit. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Great. Really good stuff. Okay. Sounds Take good. Care. Thanks.